Forest. Forest. Remember. which are important, obviously. Um, we're going to review differences in replication between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, um, primarily because we know a lot about more about the prokaryotic system. We're going to use that kind of as a little bit of a, like, an example. And then I'll point out to you the differences between our system and, and the prokaryotic or bacterial system. Um, and how we can potentially exploit um, the enzymes that are used by the bacterial system um, um, in the lab to make all kinds of good stuff. Um, recognizing that DNA replicates one time per cell cycle is insanely important to regulate ourselves and to regulate the cycle so that we don't get what we call reduplication or over of our DNA. That's really important because when you do that, you can very, very quickly lead to a transformed cell and to getting to cancer. Um, and to understand um, two very, very different things that we can do um, and that we do do that are different than kind of the normal, regular, run-of-the-mill replication. So telomerase extension telomeric repeat extension, um, and reverse transcription that we were talking about with retroviruses that we're going to utilize and exploit. Um, next time we'll talk about making cDNAs in the lab. Okay, so overview, re-replication, telomeres, reverse transcription. Yay, here we go. Remember how I said see the forest? Here it is. <coughs> <laughs> right? Obviously, DNA replication is exceedingly important and has to be spot on. I'm going to say this so many times, you're going to get a t-shirt printed that says, DNA replication is fidelitous, okay? Fidelitous. It's one of my favorite words I use all the time besides fabulous. <laughs> um, because it's so very essential that our DNA be replicated properly, right? That every single base be copied correctly. Otherwise, we get mutations and we get cancer. And that's not good. We don't want cancer if we can avoid it. Um, and we can absolutely exploit the differences that our cells and bacterial cells have. And, right, central dogma. And, X wrong, not so much anymore. We can actually use RNA as a template to make DNA. We didn't think for a long time. We thought that was like, what? Get out of town. <laughs> but now <laughs> it's very clear that you can absolutely use RNA to make DNA. So that's um, wrong, 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 wrong. And we admit when we're wrong, we're scientists. We don't like to admit when we're wrong, but we do in the end because people call us on it if we, <laughs> if we don't. So um, that's not why. <laughs> but anyway, let's look at, there are some really amazingly simple in, in reality, but complex in design, experiments that were done in the 50s that really enlightened us in terms of how this replication process actually works, right? So for a long time, we knew, okay, we start with <coughs> DNA over here, and we go through replication, and we get more DNA over here, right? Multiple copies. But we didn't really know how that process worked, and whether or not, for instance, those two strands of DNA that we started with over here well, are they still together over here and we actually just copied the whole thing and the daughters are a new template of DNA? Well, it turns out, right, no, okay? 
we have what we call semi-conservative DNA replication. So that means that every parent strand gets taken apart and gets copied to make a new hybrid parental daughter strand, right? And so Messelson and Stahl actually figured that out, okay? Using a really elegant um, design of their experiments, they were using heavy nitrogen um, within their DNA replication soup, and this is in bacteria, and they were um, essentially, what they did is they labeled up their first two strands, their first sets of DNA with heavy nitrogen, N15, okay? So they got everything labeled up, did around the replication, and then they switched that out for a lighter labeled isotope, so N14 labeled. Okay, and then they did a single round of synthesis, okay, just one round, and they were using density gradients, right, so heavy, quote unquote, heavy nitrogen will sink lower in a gradient than this lighter labeled nitrogen will, and so if you banded just the original parental DNA that was both, both strands were labeled heavily, you got a gradient band that was way down on the bottom of the gradient. Then, if you did one round of replication, now every duplex has a parental strand and a new daughter strand that's lighter. Okay, so that's going to migrate a little bit closer up to the top. So they're heavy and light strands. Okay, now if you go again and go in successive rounds, everything's going to look light, right? Except for those original strands that we got from this second, or excuse me, first round of synthesis in N14, we're always going to have that parental strand present, right? Then they're not, you're not going to get rid of that heavy nitrogen ever. So it's going to obviously get diluted out, diluted out, diluted out as you go around through multiple rounds of replication. But it's always going to be there because Right? And that tells us those parent strands are always there. Those original strands that we started from don't get tossed out the window. They're always there. Okay? So this just was a beautiful experiment, very simple in design, but allowed us to see that we had this semi-conservative replication going on. Okay. So let's start getting into the guts of what our replication is all about. <clears throat> right? So we talked a little bit about this when we were looking at the DNA and the, the polynucleotides. But in essence, right, what we want to absolutely, absolutely remember, and this gets drilled into your head a bajillion times, five prime to three prime synthesis, right? We're going in the direction. We start at the five prime end and we go in the direction of three Right? And what does that mean? It means that the three prime hydroxyl is always going to attack that next nucleotide that's coming in, in between the alpha and beta phosphates, okay, that are on the five prime position. So then this guy gets in, the pyrophosphate gets ditched out. Okay, so that's providing the energy for the reaction as well. Okay, remember. And this is something that's a little bit funky about DNA polymerization. We always need a primer, right? So DNA polymerases can never start de novo. They can't just say, bink, I'm sitting down here and starting to polymerize. They need a primer to start. And they need that because they need that 3' hydroxyl to start polymerizing. Generally, those primers are going to be RNA. So if we have RNA, right, we're going to have to get rid of that. And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit. How do we get rid of those couple of little nucleotides that are actually RNA in the growing DNA chain? Because we don't want our DNA dispersed with little bits of RNA in it. It's actually pretty awesome. Okay, and obviously, right, we need deoxynucleotides or else we're going nowhere in the long run. Right, so... Remember, and this is kind of a weird concept that you have to wrap your head around. If you've got two strands, 
and you pull them apart, right? Remember, they're anti-parallel. One's going in the five prime to three prime direction going down, and one's going five prime to three prime direction going up, okay? Just like here, or left to right, if you will. So if you open up those strings, <coughs> You have to synthesize new strands on both parental templates, right? But you've got to synthesize in the five prime to three prime direction. So you can't just start down where my palms are and start synthesizing, right? You've got to go in opposite directions when you're synthesizing as well. That can be a real pain in the butt, right? So you can't just say, think I'm sitting down and going. On the leading strand, Absolutely, you can, right? So this bottom template, if you look at the, the template, the black line here, right? Where we've opened this up, which is called an origin of replication, right? Where we start or originate the replication process. On this bottom strand, the template is in the right direction that we can just sit down and start going, right? So this red new red line here is just going to continue, continue, continue as we're opening up that replication bubble, okay? So that's cool. That's all good. That's called the leading strand, okay? But we've got a polymerase that's polymerizing on this strand, and we have an opposite polymerase that's transcribing, or excuse me, replicating on the other strand. Right? And they're moving, they're tracking along in this direction, to the right, to my right, to your right, okay? <laughs> the bulk synthesis is going in that direction. But we can't start synthesizing here. So what happens? Well, we have to wait a little bit, and we have to synthesize little fragments, which are called Okazaki fragments, on the lagging strand. Okay? As you might imagine, that synthesis is a little bit slower. Okay? So the, that heads the lagging <laughs> part. So the leading strand guy, you know, he'd really like to just sit down and go and, and get out of it. But it's kind of like, I don't know, how many of you are older or younger children? It's kind of like the younger children, I was the youngest, and my brothers were always bitching and moaning at me that I couldn't sit fast enough, right? They always had to drag me along, and mom always made them take me wherever they were going. I was the lagging child, right? I was the <laughs> lagging strand. So my brothers were the leading strand, and they had to just drag me along and wait for me, right? And that's exactly what the leading strand is doing. It's waiting. It's hooked up, hooked at the hip to this other lagging strand polymerase, and it's going to have to just kind of go at Nails, to what it could go with those okay. So the thing that we need to remember, each time we're pulling these strands apart a little bit more, a new polymerase is going to sit down and synthesize a little bit more. So the leading strand actually is exchanging polymerases, or excuse me, the lagging strand is exchanging polymerases as it goes. But each little Okazaki fragment has an RNA prime, right? So you've got to remember that. Each little time we start polymerization, we've got to have a new primer on that lagging strand. So the lagging strand has a lot of RNA built up. That's going to get removed, and we'll see how that gets removed in a minute. But just remember, and again, that always just comes back to DNA polymerization, you always got to have a primer. And so that RNA primer is going to happen many, many times on the lagging string. What else did I want to say about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not really any. So say that one more time. I'm not quite understanding what the question is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Has the template, right? So the primase, so there's actually an enzyme that lays down that sequence that's complementary to the DNA. So it's just like a polymerase, except it's actually a small RNA polymerase. Well, they're, they're making the complement of yeah. the strands, right? How can one have more codes for primers? So what you're thinking of is primers for, for like PCR, where, where you actually have to know the sequence of the primer. That's, that's, that's not the same kind of primer. So, so yes, we're priming the polymerase, but the sequence is read off of the DNA. Okay, so it's it's being synthesized as it's read. So it's not we're not adding the primer at all. The synth the sequence is delineating what the primer sequence is. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't matter at all what the sequence on the strand is, because the RNA polymerase that's making it, the primase, is reading the template that's across from it and synthesizing that primer. Appropriately. One nucleotide at a time. One nucleotide at a time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but and and I think you'll when we talk about PCR amplification and how we actually have to have synthesized a primer itself, that's that's a little bit different because we have to actually know the sequence. Here we don't because we're synthesizing the primer de novo. The cells synthesizing it for us. That makes a little more sense, maybe? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody, everybody else okay with that? You can set down the, the primer wherever on Yeah, we're not, it's we're synthesizing, yes, yeah. it's it wherever. synthesizing it's like the primer wherever. We're identifying a specific spot, it's just like, oh, this, this strand is now open. And I need a primer, here, here's exactly. A primer, and then That's a really good way to think about it, right? So. When we need a primer, we're now synthesizing it de novo. We're not having to actually add it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. This is a little bit different than, than I'm, I'm, I'm kind of editing as I'm going here. Don't worry. The, the slide, so how's this? Here's what I'm thinking. If I'm changing a slide, Right, so I've, I've loaded up all the things, but as I'm going here, I'm kind of dinking around a little bit and changing up things. It's just my nature. I dink a lot. Um, so if I'm changing a slide, I'll just load up those new slides so that you don't have to download the whole thing again. I'm just going to load up the new slides. Does that make is that good? Okay. <laughs> it's easier than having to reload the whole thing. I'll air and I'll give you the <laughs> if you want. Okay. This is just a pared down version of what you guys have so that um, we're just focusing on DNA polymerization. Okay? So there's a lot of it uh, in the ones that you've got in your in your original. It's got some repair polymerases and stuff. I didn't want to focus on that. Let's not break this. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to focus really specifically on the bulk polymerases that are utilized for regular old replication. There are multiple other DNA replicating enzymes that are utilized for the repair processes. We'll talk about those many moons from now when we talk about DNA repair. <coughs> I didn't want to confuse the issue by um, having them here. Okay, so Let's set it down here. We have bulk polymerization, um, replicative polymerases, and we have kind of secondary polymerases when we talk about DNA replication. So the primary or bulk replication polymerases are here highlighted in yellow. So for the <coughs> excuse me, bacterial system, it's Paul three, and for our cells. It's Paul Delta and Paul Epsilon. Ooh, we gotta remember our our <coughs> crazy uh, Greek. Latin. Thank you, Greek. <laughs> Greek symbols here. 
delta and epsilon. They actually go together, <coughs> and it turns out that there is um, a synthesis polymerizing um, polymerase for the lagging strand, which is called delta, and the bulk polymerase for the leaving strand is called epsilon. That changed a couple of years ago. We always used to think of it as always called delta. <laughs> and now we figured out that actually on the leading strand, it's called epsilon. Six and one half does the other. They do the same thing. Okay? So <clears throat> the bulk polymerases, as you would imagine, are the guys that are going to be synthesizing the large majority of the DNA. Okay? As you will notice, all of those bulk polymerases have what we call exonucleolytic activity. Okay? They can read in the three prime and chew back in the three prime to five prime direction. So in other words, <coughs> demonstration number one, I'm a polymerase. Okay? I'm tracking along the DNA. Polymerizing as I go. Five prime to three prime. Oh crap, I made a mistake. Shift it in. And it even comes with sound. When you backtrack over the piece of DNA, you excise that nucleotide that you just put in that was inappropriate. Okay, then put it back into forward here, and you resynthesize it back. Okay, so exonuclease activity for our bulk polymerases are absolutely essential for that fidelity of DNA replication, right? It can see behind it. It can see that it just put the wrong thing in, and it can back up, take it out, and resynthesize. That's actually a pretty amazing capability of our polymerase. How do they can do that? <coughs> it's actually reading the sequence as it's going, and it's looking at the matches, and when they're not matched up properly, they don't bond correctly. <coughs> so, no, actually, the polymerase that's involved in prokaryotic replication does it as well. Yeah. Right? <coughs> Everybody thinks, except for viruses, that, <laughs> that polymerization is essential. And it's a smart idea to keep your DNA um, intact and the right sequence. Okay? So, as you will see here, Paul Alpha are small synthesis polymerase, and we'll see how it works in a minute does not have that capability. And the reason for that is it's only synthesizing really short tracks of DNA. It's only five to 10 nucleotides that it's putting in. You'd think you could get five to 10 right, right? <laughs> <laughs> You'd think. Um, we hope <coughs> that it's getting that right. So here's a really cool polymerase. Paul 1 of E. coli is like the most amazing enzyme, except for reverse transcriptase, that I know of. Because it not only has that backup capability of exonucleolytic cleavage as it's going along, right? So it's synthesizing and it sees that it makes a mistake. It's a backup. Well, the cool thing about XO1 or about Paul1 is it actually has Pac-Man capability. It can chew five prime to three prime as well. Okay, and so that is going to be the key to removing those RNA primers for the bacterial system, right? So it runs into the primer on the lagging strand and just goes click, 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 and chops it up as it's putting in the template DNA. Okay, so it's a really cool system. We'll see that in a second. Right, so both <clears throat> uh, the, the bulk and the secondary uh, polymerases for the bacterial system have proofreading activity, only our bulk synthesis polymerases have that proofreading, right? So this is, this exo activity is what we call proofreading, right? Makes sense. We're, it's just like when you're editing a text and you see, oh man, I spelled that word wrong, I gotta take it out, rewrite it, okay? So proofreading activity is essential for these enzymes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go back to the last slide. I was yeah. just a little bit confused on um, so the bacterial cells don't have um, proofreading capability in their polymerase one. They do. They have proofreading activity, three prime to five. So three prime to five prime is the proofreading activity, right?
right? Because that's saying I'm going in reverse. I'm going backwards. But it also has XO, 5 times a 3 times XO, the Pac Man. Yes. Um, uh, the So, because they have the exo nucleus preferring to the delta and epsilon, are they both considered primary? Yes. Form? So that's yes. why. Yes. And then secondary is alpha because it can't well, be. Well, and primary is also because it does the large majority of the synthesis. Our so the secondary, the secondary activity is just going to do little, little short snippets. Little patchwork. Yep. Um, patchwork. And then is it uh, is primary synonymous with bulk? Yeah. Okay. Do they know why? Yeah, it's it's certainly slower. Right, maybe that's why. Um, that's not why they do it. <laughs> um, I I think it's just to maintain fidelity. It's to, it's right because this is such an outrageously important process in the cell. We better make sure we're doing it right. So, so the more enzymatic more. activity is just built into the polymerase itself. Okay. Nicholas. Proofread. And epsilon, correct. Yes. They're both bulk. One's for the leading strand, one's for the lagging strand. Okay. <laughs> So there's a primer on the leading strand, too. Okay, just one. And then the polymerase just goes, right? So every time a new polymerase has to sit down, a new primer has to be put down. It's per opening. It's, and it's, uh, um, so how fast does the, lead, the lagging strand go? I, I don't know how long those Okazaki, Okazaki fragments are, to tell you the truth. I would guess not longer than 30 base pairs, something like that. 200? Look at you. 200. Every 200 base pairs, you need a new primer. On the lagging strand. Only on the lagging strand. Pardon? Well, they're laid down every time you need to start a new synthesis strand. Okay, don't, let's not get hung up on this. <laughs> <laughs> we got a long way to go, and this is not a place we need to get hung up, right? Just prime, we're, we're putting down primers. Yes. So in viral polymerases, they don't have to be repeating? No. Is that why the mutation rate is so high? Yes. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. Okay, are we okay back there? <laughs> Come to a consensus about primers. Okay. Let's not get hung up. It's, it's, it's. Something that just is happening. <laughs> okay. Let's look at the process and maybe this will help. <laughs> maybe. Okay. So this is the process in the in the prokaryotic system in terms of the, the you hear the players that are on here. Okay. So our strands of DNA. Do we just open it at the end and start polymerizing? No. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. No. Because our chromosomes are ridiculously long. Right? Chromosome 1, the one that I know how to identify, is the biggest. Right? That's part of the reason why I know how to identify it. <laughs> it's the biggest. Um, and it's broken in my cells. Um, that's an easy way to identify, too. Um, no, we don't just start at the end and open it up and go. What we do is we start synthesizing at what are called origins of replication. Okay. The origins are spanned throughout the chromosomes. Okay. And they create a replication bubble. Right. So. If I 
I've got DNA and I pull it apart, I can actually synthesize in both directions, right? And that's the beauty of DNA replication, right? And this being able to synthesize on the leading strand and the lagging strand is you can go in either direction. Obviously, the leading strand is going to switch gears and switch position. But that's really cool. And that's the really cool part when you think about it, right? What happens when you finish, right? You just kind of collide <laughs> with each other. And that actually is what happens, that the origins just synthesize out until they run into the next origin. And they run into the polymerase coming in the opposite direction. Luckily, we don't have train wrecks when that happens, and it just kind of works itself out. But there are proteins that are involved in recognizing those origins and helping to melt the DNA that's there, right? So let's think about this for a second. What do you think the sequence of an origin might look like? Pretty AT rich, yeah. <laughs> Why would that be? So we can melt it and make it easily open up, right? Now it doesn't have exactly the same sequence for every origin, but they are in general quite AT rich. In us, and we'll see this in a little bit, there are um, complexes of proteins that are specifically designed to recognize those origins. Same thing in the in the um, bacterial system. We're not going to get into who's recognizing it here because we don't really care. Right? <laughs> but what we care about is that that origin is melted and we're opening it up. Now, as we're opening those strands, right, DNA tends to be pretty tightly wound. Right? And so we need proteins to act like a witch. Okay, to continue to open up the DNA as we're going along. Those proteins are called DNA helicases. They're absolutely essential for replication and for transcription as well. Right? You've got to pull those strands apart. So the helicases are always at the front edge of the bubble, so to speak. Okay? So once we've got our strands opened up, we can start synthesizing. So here's our leading strand over here. We're synthesizing, right? So we've opened up and we're reading from this three prime end. We're synthesizing in a five prime to three prime direction and we can just keep going, right? We put down our primer. The RNA primer is loaded on by a protein called primase. Here's our little enzyme right here. Right? And so here's, here's a perfect example, right? The primase is the enzyme that is reading and synthesizing that primer. Does that make sense?
Ultran, though, is on the RNA primer. Yeah. So that just stays in the DNA? No, because remember, from the other side, we're synthesizing open oxygen. Oh, so it's going to get you. Yeah, so it's going to get you. It's going to get you. I was thinking about that this morning. for short track polymerization. Because it does, if I remember right, it does also work in DNA repair. So so it's it's got its function, right? Everybody, we all have our own things that we have to do. Crosses to bear, things to do. <laughs> to fall ones involved in this. But yes, in theory, it could absolutely do the whole thing. We gotta give Paul Free a job. Otherwise, you know, he's, at, he's on the dole. We've got to go to the unemployment <laughs> office and find a new job. <laughs> okay, so let's look at let's look at how this is different in our system. Okay, so how is it different? Different polymerases, obviously. Leading strand, epsilon. Lagging strand, delta. Priming is a little bit different. So priming, we absolutely use primates. <clears throat> Same thing, lays down the RNA, but then, once again, to give Paul Alpha a job, Paul Alpha jumps in for a few nucleotides and synthesizes five to 10 nucleotides along after the priming. So it's like, Oh, please, oh, please, please, can I do something? And then the bulk polymerase jumps on, okay? So the primer, primase lays down, Paul Alpha recognizes that RNA, jumps on, synthesizes a little bit, then gets kicked off for the bulk polymerase. Paul Alpha also eats the lipid. No, it does not. It just so, recognizes the RNA primer. It just recognizes the RNA primer at the three prime end and synthesizes a little bit. So. Thank you for the segue. What happens to our RNA primers? Okay, so RNA primers, most of them, right, are on the lagging strand. DNA called delta is synthesizing bulk on the lagging strand. It runs into this thing. Okay, so think about this. Linebacker, okay, puts his head down, goes against those stupid tackle dummy things and pushes, <laughs> right? That's exactly what Paul Delta does. It jumps in, it hits this, and it in essence acts like a wedge and goes underneath and displaces the prime. Okay, doesn't chew it, displaces it. Displaces, runs into that last DNA Nucleotide that's attached to the primer, we're good to go. Now all we've got is Nick, hold on one second, that's got to get ligated, right? So we're always, on, especially on the lagging strand, but certainly on the leading strand where it's hooked up to the lagging strand, we've got to seal these gaps, right? Anything that's made that doesn't get have a phosphodiester bond in between it is a surefire template for DNA repair. So we've got to seal these nicks, and we do that with an enzyme called ligase. Always during replication, ligate those strands together. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the primers, they're obviously getting pulled off by yeah. the DNA polymerase and some other pieces off. Yep. What happens at the end of the leading strand on that little... Yeah, so remember, fragment? the Okazaki fragments are going in the opposite, are coming in from the opposite direction. And so the Okazaki fragments, the DNA polymerase, is going to do exactly this. So that leading, that primer right here is going to act, look just like this to the Okazaki fragment that's coming in from the other. But on the, the ligand, that's the ligand, right? So, the right, because remember, you're coming in from the opposite directions mm -hmm. always when you're opening up a replication bubble. So I worked it out this morning. And the, and the Okazaki fragments are coming in from the other direction are going to find that leading strand primer. Okay. 
be late. I promise. And then he got me. <laughs> I was like, what? How does that work? <laughs> um, but, uh, to finish the story, right? Now we've got this weird, crazy little bit, tail of RNA sticking up, right? What's that about? Because we've just plowed under, and the RNA little thing is there. Well, we have a magic enzyme for that. It's like an eraser, Ben one It's called a flap endonuclease, okay? Here's my double-stranded DNA. It's got a little bit of RNA hanging off the end of it. That's the flap that's recognized by flap endonucleases. It's a piece of RNA attached to a double-stranded DNA molecule. That's the flap endonuclease. Just comes in, leaves it at that phosphodiester linkage. Good to go. Choose the ligase. The ligase comes in and ligates together oh, the two, two strands of DNA. Yep. Nicholas. Yes. Not yeah. The primer that's now the primer sticking that's like up, up yeah, right from, from the tunneling from of the tall yes. delta. But then you have ligase that takes the language sugar and the Yeah, so, so once, once this is gone, right, and the DNA has come in all the way right to this spot, that polymerase is not going to join those two nucleotides together. And so the ligase comes and joins them together, makes a phosphodiesterase bond between the two nucleotides. The Fen one just removes the flap. Yep. So Which happens first, the ligase or Fen one? Fen one. Got to clean the clean the plate. <laughs> I believe, and this is um, my guess, gut feeling, that it's essentially moving along with the polymerization chain. Let's take a break. It's five after. Let's be back at quarter after. See how that works? Ten minutes. <laughs> yes. Hold delta and 